Hello and welcome. So this week I will start talking about chapter 30. And this chapter is about inductance and electromagnetic oscillations and AC circuits, okay? So this chapter is actually very long, but your reading assignment is almost half of the entire chapter. So it's very brief and it's actually very easy to read. And we will solve problems tomorrow. So I first want to start with uh, introducing something called inductance. In particular, I want to introduce a mutual inductance. Suppose you have two coils like this. The first coil comes in, like it wraps around and then goes back. And the second coil comes in, wraps around and goes back. And then you pass a current in the first one, in the first coil, but you don't pass any current in the second one. So what happens is this uh, coil will generate some magnetic flux. And you can see this generated flux because we know from right hand rule, right? If you have, if you wrap your fingers around the coils and stick your thumb out, that's the magnetic field. And that magnetic field will pierce through not only coil one, because it just keeps going, it will also go through the coil two. And now we can define something in the coil two. The flux on coil two, the phi B, phi in coil two, this is two due to one, right? This is, maybe I can write this, something like that. On coil number two, I think everybody knows about this due to coil number one. You all know about this notation. And if you have like n loops, like one, two, three, four loops, for example, this case, this flux will go times n two times this flux. Now I want to introduce something called mutual inductance. We show it with M. Again, M, mutual inductance of two due to one. This is a quantity that depends on both coils. So that's how we demonstrate that. And its definition is total flux through the loop divided by the current in the first coil. So total flux in second coil Right? This is number of coils in two times the flux in two divided by the current in the first one. And now suppose you have like some sort of alternating currents or like a way of changing the flux here. And we know if the flux is changing, it is going to induce an EMF in the second one. That's the Faraday's law. And Faraday's law goes like this. The induced EMF in the second one is minus the rate of change of flux in the second one by with time. But this is equal to some, okay, we already calculated that. Total flux is this. If you take the time derivative, number of loops do, do not change with time. So only thing, only flux changes with time. So you get something like that. Now I want to substitute to this equation, um, this flux, which we just calculated. And in this flux, okay, we will take the derivative, right? The derivative of this guy. So M is a geometric quantity that doesn't change with time in general. N is number of loops that doesn't change. The only thing that can change with time is the current. So you have to have like an alternating current to have a non-zero effect for this setup. Then what you have is like something like this. The induced EMF in the second loop is minus the mutual inductance times di1 dt. Okay. So we could play the same game by passing a current from the second loop, second coil, and measuring the EMF in the second one. In this case, you would get exactly like, just replace every one with two. So that means induced EMF in the first coil is going to be mutual inductance of one due to two 
times di to dt. Everywhere you see two will go to one, one will go to two. That's easy equation. And in general, I think we will see how to calculate this. This mutual inductances, like mutual inductance of coil two due to one is equal to mutual inductance of coil one due to two. And we will show them with some M without any subscripts. So is in SI units, you can calculate the unit of this. Okay, this is like um, flux, but flux is what? Flux, uh, D flux over DT is something like volt. Then flux is volt times second. And this is volt times second divided by ampere. You can see that volt is ampere times ohm. So amperes cancel. So you have ohm times second, or you can call this halt, halting Henry, the unit of mutual inductance. Okay, here's a warm up example. So two coils which are close together have a mutual inductance of 330 millihenry. If the EMF in coil one is 120 volts, what is the rate of change of current in the coil? And if the rate of change of current in the coil one is 36 ampere per second, what is the EMF in coil two? So M is given, it is like 330 times 10 to minus three Henry. And EMF in coil one is this, what's the rate of change in coil two? So E1 is equal to minus M the I2 over the T, then the I2 over the T is equal to minus E1 over M, which is going to be equal to what? E1 is 120 volt. M is 330 times 10 to the minus three Henry. And this thing is going to be what? 0 0.36 times 10 to the three. And the unit should be ampere per second. This is A. And the B is if the rate of change of current in coil one is, okay, what is the EMF into? Then I will use this one, E2 is equal to minus M the I1 DT. And this is like minus 330 times 10 to minus three times the I DT is 36 ampere per second. This is Henry. If you multiply these guys, clear 330 times 36 is equal to 11,000, something like 11.8 volt. Good. All right, maybe more examples to play with this mutual inductance. Okay, let me clean this. Let me clean this one too. A solenoid and a coil, a long thin solenoid of length L, this guy, and cross section area A contains N1 closed the peg turns of wire. And wrapped around, it is an insulate, insulated coil. Okay, they don't touch each other, but there's like, there can be a current here of N2 turns. This one is N2 turns, this one is N1 turns. Assume all flux from coil one, the solenoid passes through coil two and calculate the mutual inductance. So first, I think I would calculate the magnetic field here and we know the magnetic field of a solenoid. So if you have an ideal solenoid, magnetic field is I think something like that mu zero N, like this called this number of loops divided by uh, total length times the current passing through. And we have a current here that's given to be I1. 
And now flux is basically B times A, which is going to be nu zero, N over L I one times area. So this flux is the flux inside. And we assume all of this passes through this thin loop. We assume there is no leak of flux. Then we can do the derivative. D phi, okay, this, this is in the loop two. Okay, this is in the loop one actually, right? This is B one, flux one. Okay, this is area one. D flux one dt is equal to mu zero and let's call this n1 n1 over l the only thing that depends on time is the current the i1 over dt times area right and the induced emf is what minus d phi to the t, but we assume all the flux from the first one passes through the second one. So this thing is equal to this one, right? So let's put that in. This is going to be, but also there's like number of loops, like there'll be some flux and there's like number of loops here. So I need to put that number too. So it's going to be minus N2 times, maybe I can write it like what we wrote in the class. I think we put something like that. N2. And mu zero and one over L area D I one DT, this is two. Right, and according to this formula, here, the EMF is proportional to the IDT. Anything in front is the mutual inductance. Then mutual inductance is something like mu zero, N1, N2 divided by length times area. You can see apart from an overall constant of vacuum uh, permeability, this thing is a purely geometric. Number of loops, length and area. So here's a conceptual example, reversing the coils. How would example one change if the coils with N2 turns was inside, inside the solenoid rather than outside? Suppose this loop outside is actually inside. Would the answer change? Or if it does, how does it change? Does it increase or decrease? So area of loop two is smaller than a would go to some A2, which is smaller than A, then M decreases. And here's an exercise. Which solenoid and coil combination shown in the here figure has the largest mutual inductance? And assume each solenoid is the same. So this solenoid here, they are all the same, but these little coils, are different, seems to me. And we are trying to find uh, one with the largest inductance. So I would say the flux through this one and this one are not that much, right? So I just eliminate these two. So this one is like perpendicular. So there may be no flux at all because it has to go through the coils. So this one is gone. So I just compare these two. So this one has smaller area, this one has bigger area. So this one definitely has bigger flux through it. So this one is going to have 
the largest, this one. Like B has largest M. Now I want to introduce something called self-inductance. So, so far we had like two coils. Like for example, there's like two coil here, one inside, one outside. There are two coils here, one next to each other. But actually this inductance is something that still persists even if you have a single coil like this. And the idea is like as follows. Suppose you pass a current through this coil. And as you pass the current, there'll, like, there'll be a current, so there'll be a flux here. But since you are switching on the current, there is like a change of current, then that means there's like a change of flux. Initially it's zero, for example, but as you switch, it's going to be non-zero. But we know if there is like a change of flux, there'll be an induced EMF. And that's, the, that's related to self-inductance. So the flux here is proportional to current. And if you define something like this, number of loops times flux divided by the current, exactly like this. <laughs> what did we call number of loops, flux divided by current. And for the mutual, we had that. For single coil, we have exactly the same thing. N phi divided by I, that's called the self-inductance. And the flux, if the flux is changing, there's gonna be some induced EMF, which is going to be minus N times D phi DT. And I plug in this result. And um, that means the flux is going to be proportional to L times I over N. So at the end, I have something like this, minus L times DI DT. You can actually take this as the definition of self-inductance. That's also perfectly fine, right? Induced EMF is proportional to DI DT and the proportionality constant is something called L. So here, if you are increasing the current, right? If you are increasing the current, that means the flux is increasing. And that means by Lenz law, the circuit should do something to reverse that. And that means there'll be a negative induced EMF. So if you increase current in this direction, the induced EMF is gonna be in the opposite direction. And if your current is decreasing, that means the flux is decreasing. So the circuit should reverse that, should, should react to that. And for this case, you have to have a positive EMF. That's why sometimes it, call, it is called impedance, right? The coil impedes the current. If it's increasing, it just tries to decrease it. If it's decreasing, it tries to increase it. Or sometimes they call it reactance. And if we have things like this in our circuit, that's going to give some interesting things. And we show it with like this coil, not surprisingly, in the circuit. Okay. So maybe I can solve this example and give a five minute break. A solenoid inductance. Determine a formula for the self-inductance of inductance L of a tightly wrapped and long solenoid containing n turns of wire in its length of L and whose cross-sectional area is A. And B calculate the value of L if n this L is A is, okay. So again, we can start with what we know, the magnetic field. So it's like mu zero, density of loops times current. Flux through the solenoid is B times A, which is going to be U zero and over L times current times area. And the definition of inductance L 
is just let's look what we have here. It's like n times phi over i. So we, I already have one factor of n, so it's like mu zero n square divided by L, I just canceled I times area. And now let's calculate this <clears throat> B to get a sense of overall magnitudes. So L should be equal to what? Mu zero is, I remember it was like something like four times 10 to minus seven. And the unit was something like what? Uh, something like Tesla meter per ampere times uh, we have n squared. It's like 10 to the two times 10 to the two, 10 to the four times area is 0 0.3 times, okay, centimeter. 10 to the minus 2 times 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, and divide this whole thing with L, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. And the result, okay, cancel this one, this one, cancel this one with minus 5, and calculate the rest. Point, oops. This is 0 0.75 times 10 to the minus 5. Henry. Is that right? Take one zero to here. This is minus 6. Minus 6 is micro, so it's like 7 pi 0 0.5 times micro Henry. So that's the orders of magnitude we are talking about in general. More examples. So this is a conceptual example number four from the book. The direction of EMF in inductor. Current passes through the coil in figure four. Here is the figure four. From left to right as shown. And A, if the current is increasing with time like this, in which direction is the induced EMF? So I increasing, then induced EMF, in which direction is it? Inductance in the other, other direction, yes. So, so in maybe I can use the induced is reverse. Maybe I can put like a direction like this. This is the Lenz law. And similarly, if I decreasing, okay, this one I'll answer myself. E induced is in this direction. Maybe reverse is not a good word for here. I'll delete this, push this like this. So one more example, let's clean this. This is example five, coaxial cable inductance. You have a coaxial cable. This is like, I think we studied something like this before, but we are just looking at the cross section, a tiny cross section here like a cable like this, there's another cable like this. And if one current is passing this way, goes wherever it goes and comes back and passes through this way. So, and we would like to determine the inductance per unit length of a coaxial, coaxial cable whose inner conductor has a radius R1 and the other conductor has a radius R sub two, like in the figure. And assume the conductors are thin hollow tubes. So there is no magnetic field within the inner conductor, like within each, there's no, and also within, there's also no magnetic field inside here. And the magnetic fields inside both thin conductors can be ignored, like here. 
this one. And if you think this is like thick and there are like magnetic fields, you neglect that. And the conductors carry equal currents I in opposite directions. Okay, let's zoom in. So basically what the question is saying that, I think we know from Ampere's law, there is no magnetic field here. And we ignore if there is any magnetic field within the conductor, we ignore that. And all the magnetic field we need to take into account is like in this region. And our root is, okay, calculate B and calculate flux. And from the flux, calculate L, right? I think B is easy. B is basically use Ampere's law. I will write it here, Ampere's law is something like that. B dot DL is equal to mu zero I enclosed. And for that, we will choose an Amperion loop like this. You can choose an Amperion loop like this, but you'll see enclosed current is zero. So there'll be no magnetic field here. You can choose an Amperion loop like this. And the total current is I plus minus is zero, so there's no flux outside. Every magnetic field is within the two shells. So then I calculate it because for this circle, the magnetic field is constant. So I can take this B outside the integral and multiply with the length, which is two pi L. I think we did exercises before, like this before. This will be two pi R times B is equal to new zero times I enclosed is I. And my magnetic field is mu zero over two pi I over R. I think we knew about this, but that's like a good reminder. Now flux, how do I calculate the flux? So flux is like going, okay. It's like going in this direction, right? So if you have like a cross section here, you need to calculate this, this flex, it's going inside. So basically there's like a cross section of this coaxial cable in your book, nicely drawn. So here's the first cylinder, here's the second cylinder, and those are the cross sections. But the problem with this B is it's changing with the radius. And we know how to do this. We just convert things to integrals. So I just write something like this. So the flux trailing this infinitesimal strip here can be written as if the magnetic field is constant, which it is within this region. So it's going to be B times A, dA. And it's just like mu zero over two pi current divided by radius. And dA is what? This area here is L times dR. So this is, oops, dR times L. Now I can integrate to find the flux. Flux is going to be equal to mu zero over two pi I times L integral over integral of one over R dr and r goes from r1 to r2 and now we are you know what this integral is i'll just write the result by looking so it's just by looking at the limits this is basically just mu zero over two pi i l times logarithm r2 over r1 now, if we have something like this, we know what the mutual inductance is. Mutual inductance is everything that multiplies the current. Phi is equal, okay, not phi. M, maybe I can write it below. M is basically, not M, L, right? Um, Mutual inductance is equal to L 
mu zero over two pi times L times logarithm R2 over R1. Or if the problem is asking like what? Problem is like inductance per unit length. Well, I just multiply, divide by L, L over L is equal to mu zero over two pi logarithm R2 over R1. Again, you can see up to a constant, a physical constant, this thing is purely geometric. So, okay. Now I want to uh, consider the energy storage in a magnetic field. So the setup is the same. You pass a current and that current is supposedly um, changing. Otherwise you wouldn't have any magnetic field here. And if the current is changing and if there is a magnetic field, what is the energy related to this? That's what I want to consider. So the idea is to change this, to change this current, you have to supply a power through the circuit. And the power supplied to this inductor to pass this current I can be calculated, right? It's like power is I times induced EMF. Like you can just consider like what we know for a resistor, it's like, or like a normal circuit, it's like I times V. For this case, it's like I times induced, induced EMF. But induced EMF is equal to what? Induced EMF is we just define self-inductance times di dt. And then we just plug in and we find something like this for power. Power is I times V, which is L di dt. So that's what you should do to do to pass a current from this inductor. inductor. Now, what is the, we want to now go from power to energy and the way to go from power to energy is to consider work done. If your power is this, work done is, power is basically work done per unit time. So then work is P times dt. And I integrate this with time and I just plug this in here in this P. Then I have something like this and I need to integrate this with respect to time, times are gone. I just integrate this L I D I. This is basically one half L I squared. Then work done in a system is equal to energy stored in that system. And I use this like stored energy U is equal to work done. And basically this stored magnetic energy is one half L I squared. And I want you to compare this with the capacitor, right? For the capacitor, we had some capacitor. And in this case, okay, maybe I can write a little bigger. So in the case of capacitor, we had some parallel plates and within this parallel plates there was like electric field and this electric field was the source of energy and its form was given with this u of e was equal to one half c v squared for the uh, inductor we have exactly the same thing one half c is replaced with l and v squared is replaced with i squared And you can remember we derived this formula and then we uh, converted it to purely the electric field inside. Can we do the same thing for here in terms of magnetic field? And here's how we do it. We express this in terms of B like this for an ideal solenoid. This is the magnetic field, mu zero times number of loops in the solenoid divided by length times current. And the flux is just this times area. And inductance L is just, we just gave it, and we actually drive this mu zero times n squared over L times A. 
And if I plug this in here, I have something like this. And now I try to identify magnetic field from here. And there's like a factor of magnetic field, you can take it out. And there's like a overall volume. At the end, you find something like that. Simple exercise. You just plug this in here and then extract this magnetic field and you'll get this. Do this, it's very simple. And this is the energy density related to magnetic field. And I remind you the similar thing for capacitor. For the capacitor, we had something like this. The electric field, energy due to electric field was equal to one half epsilon zero times E squared. I think everybody knows this very well. And you can compare it. Again, one half epsilon zero goes to one over mu zero and E squared goes to B squared. A very nice symmetry between E and B that we have been observing all along. We also have it for inductance, inductors and magnetic fields as we should. All right, now we can now think about circuits. Maybe I can pull in this and do this whole thing because it's important. So I want to think about these uh, inductors in a circuit. How does the current change? How do you describe the circuit, right? So first I want to consider the switch. Okay, this is the circuit, right? We have like a battery, we have a switch. We can go between like battery and no battery. And we have a resistor and we have an inductor L. And I'd like to find the current through this circuit when the switch is in this position. Okay, let's mark this. So let's consider switch in this position and write an expression for current. So I can use Kirchhoff law because there is like a battery and there's kind of like a, something like a battery if you like, or something like a resistor if you look from a different point of view. But the Kirchhoff law, I need to choose a loop. I, I will use the loop rule, okay. Let's choose a color. So maybe a little thicker. So here is my loop. This one, this one, and this one. And I want to use Kirchhoff loop rule. Maybe I can just write it. So it's going to be like what? So this one start from this bigger V to smaller V as I move, it's going to increase. So it's like going to be V zero minus, maybe I can use another color. V zero. And I come to here, the current and the resistor are the same. So I am passing the resistor in the direction of the current. So it's going to be minus times R. And now I came to inductor and inductor is going to give me some EMF, but we just derive the EMF of an inductor, I think here, right? Something like that. And I'll put minus L E I T T. And I pass this and when I'm here, I'm basically done, everything is included. So this thing should be equal to zero. So this is Kirchhoff loop rule. All right. Now I want to solve this equation for I. So let's just put I's in one side. So it's like some resistor times I plus some inductance times EI dt should be equal to V naught. Or I can write it like, okay, 
d i d t should be equal to v zero minus r times i divided by l. Good. Now I put everything with I on one side and everything with T on the other side, as we always do. So it's going to be something like this, Ti divided by um, D0 over L minus R over L times i is equal to dt. Now I integrate both sides. And if I integrate on the uh, left-hand side, I have logarithm. So I have something like ln b0 over l minus r over l times i. So let's take the derivative and see if, if I reproduce. This is going to be mod over v0 divided by l times i times minus r over l times one. So I have an overall factor of this, then I will just put minus l over r is equal to, on the other side, I have something like T plus some constant. Okay, now I can clean this. So I can put minus T. Okay, let's push this a little bit. So this is minus R over L. And I clean this guy. Now I can solve it for V0 over L. So V0 over L minus R over L times I, right, is equal to some constant, let's say, call it A times E to the, um, E to the what? e to the minus r over l times t. So now I need to determine uh, the, I need to determine this overall constant a, this one. So for this, I know if t is equal to zero, what should the current be? As soon as you close the switch, what do you expect? The current, there is no current, right? The current is building up. So it, as soon as you close the switch, you can't get the current. It takes some time to build the current. So I is zero. Then if you put zero in this equation, A is going to be equal to V zero. Oh, okay. I think I, I have to leave I itself. So it's something like this. So I can put in that form. So first, something like that. And so this is going to be V over R. Okay, now I can put I is equal to zero. Yes, because I is by itself, okay. So this is like that. Now A is equal to V zero over R. That's a reasonable thing. And I, I can write an expression for this. V zero over R one minus E to the minus r over l times t. Good, I think that makes sense. 
And here you can see there's like a time constant because this thing is multiplying the time. So I'll define tau as L over R. And we should compare this with capacitor uh, or RC circuits. And in that case, tau was equal to, does anybody remember? What's the tau for RC circuits? RC, yes. Thank you. Now I can plot the current and see how it changes. Okay, let's put some axes. That's X, that's Y. So this is time. This is current. So initially it is going to be zero. And you can see as T goes to infinity, this guy drops and you have some constant value. So initially you have something like this. At the late times you have something like this and it's going to just connect. Okay. So now I want to do this exercise. It says that show that L over R does have dimension of time, this thing. So the idea is L, okay. But let's pick up a blue color. So dimension of L, how do we, de how do we decide what the dimension of L should be? The definition of L was what? It was like N times phi divided by current plus L. And phi, okay, what is the dimension of flux? You know, flux is Weber, but we, if we didn't remember the unit of flux, we can use Faraday's law. It was something like that. Volt was equal to what? D phi dt, that means it's like, that means phi is volt time times second, right? Then L over R in terms of dimensions is going to be flux divided by I times R in terms of dimensions. And then phi is volt times second. This is ampere and this is ohm. And does this have the, uh, okay, what I can do is I know uh, I times R is also volt. So this is like volt times second divided by volt. And I can cancel volts and this is going to be equal to units of seconds. Now I want to do the same thing without a battery. Let's just do this without a battery, then this V is going to be missing. This V is going to be missing. There'll be no V here. There'll be no V here. This is zero. This is zero, no V. And if you have no V, this equation is going to be like what? Okay, we have to solve this equation. And without V, we need to change the initial condition at T is equal to zero. I should be equal to I zero. Then the overall constant will be, A will be I zero. Then this thing will be I zero times E to the minus T R over L. Right, and let's draw this with blue. So initially it's some, at t is equal to zero, you have the current. Now you are doing exactly the same thing. You have some, you just change the position of switch. Let's also indicate that. Switch position is now here. There's no battery. And initially you start with current, 
but that current sh should decay with time because you have like a uh, energy stored in the inductor and it's going to dissipate through the circuit. So for that, the current should start at some non-zero value and at late time it should be zero. So it's going to be something like that. Okay. So I rem remind you, this is VIT battery. This one is without battery. I think once we saw one, the other one is easy. All right, maybe an example. Okay, let me clean this. So an LR circuit, this is example six. At T is equal to zero, a 12 volt battery is connected in series with 220 millihenry inductor and a total of 30 ohm resistance as shown in figure here. There's like a 12 volt battery, you seem to have a switch. There's like a 30 ohm resistor and 220 millihenry inductor. So A, what is the current at T is equal to zero? Okay. A, we know I of T is equal to zero is almost, there is no inductor. It's going to be V zero over R. This is going to be equal to 12.0 divided by 30 ohm, which is going to give you at 0 0.4 ampere. Okay, this is the voltage at T is equal to zero. Sorry, what am I doing? At T is equal to zero, okay. I, this is without the battery, oops. So at T is equal to zero, I is equal to zero, as it should, right? Zero current. Is that correct? Okay, no comments. B, what is the time constant? Time constant tau is um, L over R, right? And this is going to be equal to 220 millihenry, which is like 10 to minus three, Henry, divide this thing with a resistor, which is 30 ohm, and let's do this equal to 7.3 times 10 to the minus three second. A, B, C, what is C? What is the maximum current? Okay, this one, I zero, this is the maximum. This is max current is equal to now this one is V zero over R, and this is equal to V zero 12.0 volt, divide this by 30 ohm, this is going to be 0 0.4 ampere. So D, how long will it take the current to reach half its maximum possible value? I of T is equal to V zero over R times one minus E to the minus T over tau, right? And for it to reach half of its maximum value it means like this one half V zero over R and cancel this with this, then E to the minus T over tau is going to be equal to one half, then minus T over tau is going to be equal to ln one over two, and which is equal to minus ln two, which is equal to what? This is minus 0.69, then T is equal to this one times time constant times 7.3 is equal to 5.05 .05 times 10 to the 
minus three seconds. Okay. So this is A, B, C, D, E at this instant, at this instant, at what rate is energy being delivered to the battery? So at what rate energy is being delivered to battery is, okay. E, okay, power delivered is equal to whatever the current is times the voltage. And it is going to be equal to V, uh, at this instant, the current is half of its maximum value. Let's just, just, just put this V over R times V zero over R times one half. This is maximum times V is V nut from the battery. And if I multiply these numbers, this is 2.4 Watt. And finally, okay. F at what rate is the energy being stored in the inductor's magnetic fields? Okay. It's F, the power inductor. I think we know it was like what? Some current times I times V, but now it's like induced EMF, but it is going to be I times L times the I DT. Right, and this I is equal to V zero over R one minus E to the minus T over tau, and at that instant it's equal. To this thing is one half, and the I dt is going to be equal to. Take the derivative. So the I dt is equal to v0 over r e to the minus t over tau times 1 over tau. But this thing is also 1 half at that instant. So then p, let's put all these things in, v0 over r times 1 half times uh, L times V zero over tau times R times, okay, this last one half is here. So I see some nice cancellations. Okay, this tau is equal to L over R, so they are gone. This whole thing is going to be equal to, what, one over four V zero squared over R. Now I can calculate this. This is like 1.2 watt, okay? And that's basically it. Do I have anything else? Okay, I don't have to do that. And my question to you is, maybe to close, this is 1.2 watt in the inductor but the battery provides 2.4 watt. What happened to half of this provided power? So battery gave you 2.4 watt, but in the inductor, you only got 1.2 watt. Where is the other half? Yes, exactly. So 1.2 watt dissipated in the resistor. Maybe you can try to calculate that. Okay. I, I think I have like, okay, I think this is not very essential. Okay, I'll skip this. I think this is the end for today. Thanks for coming, I think. I'll see you guys tomorrow and solve some problems.